I'd venture to guess that you've never touched $2 million in cash. Most of us haven't. I'd also venture to guess that you've never been in the middle of the Gobi Desert, which, in case you didn't know, is in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of nowhere, Mongolia. And I'd also venture to guess that you've never had $2 million in cash on you in the middle of the Gobi Desert. Yeah, I didn't think so. Welcome to Business with Purpose. I'm your host, Molly Stillman of stillbeingmolly.com, and this show is all about bringing you the stories behind the brands, companies, and small businesses that are changing the world. Each week, I interview an entrepreneur, a CEO, nonprofit director, community leader, or just all around amazing person who is trying to make a positive impact, not only through their personal life, but also with their professional career. My goal is to show you that no matter what you do for a living, you can make an impact right where you are. My guest this week is Matt Scanlon, the co-founder of Natum, the fairest and most sustainable Mongolian cashmere clothing company in the world. Matt's storytelling skills are unreal. And yes, my whole intro about carrying $2 million in cash, cold, hard cash in the middle of the Gobi Desert. Yeah, Matt did that. Trust me, you are not going to want to miss this episode. It's probably going to be one of your new favorites. Just you wait. So enjoy my conversation with Matt. Hey, Matt. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I am pumped to have you on the show with us today. And you know what? Honestly, I was doing uh, a little bit of mild internet stalking uh, before <laughs> before we set uh, to record today. And there's so much about you and your story and Nadam that I am really, really interested to learn about. So we're going to kind of skip all the fluff and the riffraff, and we're going to get right to it. So I'm going to have you do what all of my guests do, and that's tell us the Matt 101. Tell us your story. Tell us your background, how you got started. And uh, for, for those that are not familiar with Nadam, tell us all about Nadam and what you guys do. Uh, well, how much time do you have here? Because, <laughs> uh, this story could take a little while. So, um, well, I guess I should start about four years ago. I had spent three years working um, uh, finance. I'll, I'll couch it in finance for, for about three years. And kind of got fed up with it. It was more of a process of learning about the things that I didn't want to do than the things I wanted to do. And I quit. Just went in one day and said, I'm done. And I wasn't sure if I was going to go to business school next or what it was, but I knew I had some time off. And it just so happened a couple of weeks later, I got a phone call from one of my now business partners and a previous college roommate who was uh, studying he was studying econometrics, which is a um, type of economics that looks at currency exchange rate fluctuations. And he was just finished his master's program, was looking at maybe some further education, but he had some time off. Mm -hmm. And he was based in Beijing. And he'd heard a lot about this beautiful part of Asia called Mongolia. Now, Mongolia is a really, really unique area. And I'll tell you a bit more about that. But yeah. Um, yeah. He had reached out to me. He said, you know, I'm going. i got a couple of weeks. I might be doing some backpacking. You're my only friend who doesn't really have a job or anything, so <laughs> you should probably come along. And so I did because he was right. I didn't really have a job or You're anything. You're like, well, I mean, why not? <laughs> yeah. It was a couple weeks later. I was um, off to Mongolia. Wow. Um, like, like I said, it's a really beautiful, unique country. Um, it's about twice the size of Texas in terms of land mass, but it only has 3 million people in it. So that's a third of the population living in New York City in a country twice the size of Texas. It's actually one of the least densely populated countries in the world. Interestingly, about half the population of the country is nomadic. So fully nomadic, like wow. the real word nomadic. They yeah. don't own homes or any land. They live in gurs, um, commonly referred to as yurts. I think uh, we in the West know them as yurts, yeah. but um, they're like big tents, and uh, they herd animals. They subsist on animal husbandry as the main uh, form of income, and actually it makes up about 10% of the GDP of the country is, is built around animal husbandry, so critical to the economy are this really unique lifestyle and as part of that lifestyle there's this really unique culture and yeah. heritage that's been literally bred over a thousand years of these folks living on the steppe the steppe you'll hear frequently from someone who's been to mongolia 
is basically the open plains. And a majority of those plains are deserts. Uh, the Gobi Desert is the largest desert yeah. in Asia and really unique place. It's not like the Sahara Desert. There, there's really no, like, it's not like sand. I mean, there, I think there are maybe some patches, but it's green pastures. It kind of looks like Montana, I think, or like Utah, maybe. I have but actually, I've heard that. It's beautiful. It's, it's unbelievable. So anyways, he said, let's go. And we went and we're crashing at this hostel uh, in Ulaanbaatar. Ulaanbaatar is the capital of, of Mongolia. Um, pretty unbelievable city. Half of the population, so the half that isn't nomadic, lives in this city. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's been developing at an unbelievably fast rate. Last time I was there, you look up from street level and there's 10 buildings being built right in front of you. So it's wow. developing – at an astonishing pace, due part due to the mining industry that's um, kind of exploded in the country. I think it might have stalled just very recently, but yeah. it, it's um, attracted a lot of people to the city. Anyways, we're staying there, and we're at a bar, obviously. We're like, what the hell do we do here? So we're at a bar, and we meet these two guys. And the names are Bodio and Ishe, and we spend the whole night hanging out with them. They're super cool remarkable, remarkable people. They grew up as nomadic herders and they lived in the countryside and then moved to, moved to the city. And were they older or were they younger? Older. I think, I think they're in their forties. Okay. My guess, but I think Bodie's a grandpa. He might be in his fifties, but I, I, I think he's a grandpa. Yeah. Um, and, but they're like the coolest, nicest, warmest guys you've met. And, we hang out with them all night and have this awesome time, build what has now become a really beautiful friendship. But at the time, there were just these two dudes we met. And they, by the end of the night, had asked us to come along to the countryside with them the following morning. They were going out to visit their family. And I guess we didn't really ask too many questions, although I can't remember that well. <laughs> but we didn't ask too many questions. And... Uh, Ishe speaks English. Bodio really doesn't speak English that well. I mean, he does, but I think 30% of the time he's pretending he understands you. So yeah. we really have Ishe as our, our translator. Anyways, meet them 6 a.m. the next morning, and we're going to drive out to the countryside. So we start driving out of the city, and about an hour and a half goes by, and we turn off the road and start off-roading, and... I assume that this means like we're getting close, right? We're like, this is like a cool <laughs> off-roading experience or whatever. And they just keep on going. They ended up driving for about 20 hours. 20 hours? Off-roading the entire entire way. And it's now kind of the middle of the night. We haven't seen people in probably 15 hours. And so we're getting a little worried. But then the car starts to sputter a little bit and we hear some like weird noises coming from the engine and the engine starts smoking so we get out of the car figuring like okay we'll fix this or whatever this is we, obviously there's gonna be issues we've been driving for 20 hours yeah, and- like, wait, how did you not run out of gas like what about food bathrooms <laughs> i have so many questions <laughs> well um we bring some canned meat with us which actually is pretty good um we bring a lot of gas with us and uh, you know, we're four guys driving. Yeah, that's in the car, true. So. True. Good. Good point. Good point. Touche. I'm a girl, so I, like I have. I have. I'm like, all right. I'm gonna need to know where the bathrooms are. I'm gonna need to know where the snacks are. You know, I'm going yeah, on a road trip. Yeah. <laughs> it was. Uh, I had. I'd snuck a couple handfuls of Snickers with me, <laughs> and uh, I still do that pretty much every time I go yeah. out. Well, I live on that stuff, but um, it turns out the car had broken down, and it wasn't because we didn't bring enough gas, just because the engine had overheated. And I don't know engines that well. But it wasn't going to keep on – the car wasn't going to keep on going. Yeah. Um, so now we're sitting by the car. It's pitch black. It's freezing cold now. The desert gets freezing cold. We're, in there in the, we're there in the summer, but now it's the nighttime. And so the temperature in the desert drops, and it's freezing cold. And they have a big satellite phone. It looks like a cell phone from the 80s or something. And they make a phone call – and we sit there even longer and then like all of a sudden 
couple guys on motorcycles drive by. I'm like, okay, what is this about? So turns out this is our ride the rest of the way. We get in the back of the motorcycles and we drive for another two hours deeper into the Gobi Desert through an area known as the Outer Gobi in the Bayahungor Imag. That's mm, southwestern Mongolia. And, but we finally arrive at a small gur uh, owned by Dash. Dash is a nomadic herder and his father was a nomadic herder, his father's father, and so forth. He's been doing this forever, and his son will be a nomadic herder. And they live in this tiny gear, and they herd goats, and we're in the middle of nowhere. But Dash comes out with a bottle of goat's milk vodka. And goat's milk I've and vodka. never heard of that before. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, it's pretty disgusting stuff. <laughs> I was but say, it does not sound good. <laughs> You drink enough of it, you get drunk. Um, <laughs> so we spent the night hanging out with Dash, and um, it was just really unbelievable, unique experience um, that we felt like we would never forget. So we wake up in the morning. I don't know. Have you ever had that feeling where you wake up after really you've done something really stupid the night before, and you kind of like have a moment where you've woken up and you don't quite remember, and you're like, maybe that didn't happen. <laughs> that was like my first thought that like you wake up and you're like, maybe I'm back in my room at home. But that really wasn't the case. Like and maybe I didn't just drive 20 hours in the Gobi Desert. Yeah. And listen, there's no electricity. There's no running water out here. It's extremely, extremely remote. The people are unbelievable, extremely warm-hearted. And while well, we wake up and I go to Bodio and Ishii and I say, okay, like how are we going to fix the car off? Like what's the strategy here for getting home today? And it was throughout the conversation that we realized that we were actually going to be staying – with Dash for a month, about a month. And um, <laughs> that was pretty pretty crazy. And we had no way of communicating with anyone back home. We were pretty much lost in the Gobi Desert. Oh, it was, oh my goodness. It was, it was positioned as, yeah, we like told you we were staying this long. And um, you can find a different way home. Like that's totally – you can leave whenever, obviously – if someone drives by, we'll just put you in that car and they'll take you and then someone else will take you a little bit further and you know that's how it works. In any event, uh, we weren't doing that. So we stayed for a month and we lived with this family. And throughout, throughout that time, we started to learn a lot about the nomadic heritage. Um, we started to learn a lot about um, kind of the value system of the nomadic herder. And then even further, we started to learn, we started to learn about the livelihood, how they make, how they make money, where they make money from and kind of what that, what, what props up this remote economy. Because when you're out there, you're like, how does this even work? Right. Like, how do you guys survive? Because the winters are unbelievably difficult, like negative 40 degrees Oof. on average. It'll snow like 10 feet of snow in just a couple of hours. It's, there's, they have a windy season where it blows people over. Like it's very, very extreme. But they subsist through this time and they're not unhappy. And relatively speaking, they're not actually that poor. They're not – they make money. They just don't really use banking or anything. Right. Uh, but cashmere costs money and they do get paid some money. So they, they actually – have money laying around, like literally under mattresses and stuff. Um, mm. But so we're trying to figure this all out. In any event, we leave and we decide we should focus on trying to provide stability because it sounds like this lifestyle is a very variable one. And so in the process of wanting to provide stability, we set out a strategy for developing a microeconomic development program um, through a nonprofit. And we start raising money. We actually do a Kickstarter to see if maybe we sell some sweaters, not knowing that that would end up being the business we were in, if that works to help raise some money for the herders. Mm -hmm. um, we ended up getting a little bit of money there. We get a little money from friends and family and a couple of other donations. And we start funding a program, a, a livestock program and livestock insurance programs for not only Dash but – pretty much everyone in his community, which is tens, tens of herders, herding families. And the focus for us was we, I mean, it's simple actually. And all microeconomic development kind of centers around this idea that if I give you a dollar, 
you'll buy something from someone next door and you give them that dollar and kind of goes around in circles and eventually the economy starts to evolve and you're not really providing a crutch. You're helping build up the local economy so it can exist at a higher level without you there. Right. Um, so if you invested in a veterinary program, for instance, and you improved the value of fiber for a goat by making a healthier goat, then they would get paid more money and more money would be traded amongst themselves in this local economy because it's so remote. It's not like the money goes anywhere. Right. Uh, and all of a sudden things would be invested in like roads and agriculture or uh, so something, something like that. Right. Uh, and so we started doing that and it was a year or so of trying to, to do that that we realized wasn't really having the impact we wanted. Um, we were doing all this nonprofit work with Bodio and Ishe and Bodio had done some work before on his own to support his family and things like that. So we had all these relationships and that was key, right? What's key to take away here at this point is that we were building really substantial relationships and we were starting to learn about one critical element which is that no matter how much nonprofit work we do, no, how, how much we want to impact this community, they are still subjected to the trade system of selling cashmere to traders who then sell it to brokers, who then sell it to mills, who sell it to manufacturers, who sell it to clothing companies. Right. And then at the very bottom of this value chain, now, unfortunately, in these remote areas, despite there being generally – there, there are like market prices determined every year for cashmere, but in most remote areas, and Mongolia is all remote, that's not what herders get traded. And while the government is like, yes, we have regulated pricing, that's not the case at all. In these remote areas, traders arrive, they agree as a group, say, hey, we're the only guys coming out here to buy your material. We're not paying the market price. We're going to undercut the market price pay you very little and we're going to make a big markup in between mm -hmm. as we sell it to the broker who's then going to sell it to the the mill. Um, and so that means we couldn't increase the value of the cashmere uh, from a monetary standpoint. That was a huge blow. Um, so we gave it a, a, a lot of thought and realized the only way we were actually going to be able to disrupt this process is through good old disintermediation. Let's become the middleman. Let's buy all the cashmere from ev all of these folks. Let's do our nonprofit work, but let's also buy our cashmere. And then, instead of being a trader who pushes the prices low, let's let's even the stakes. Let's pay more than the market price is asking for. Yeah. And and let, let's get real value to the herders for what for the work that they're doing. But let's never resell it. Let's not resell it to a broker. Let's not resell it to a mill. Let's own it and produce our own yarn and then our own sweaters. And in doing so, we'll help the people at the bottom of the supply chain, but then we're going to still get it at a lower cost than anybody else in the world, which we then can make products that are the highest possible quality at the lowest possible price. Yeah. That was the big the big dream for us. Um but then we had to figure out how to get enough money to buy everything in this region, and that's a lot. Or not everything, but enough that we could disrupt business as usual for traders. Right. And so we settled on about two and a half million would be the number. And so we went to a private investor in New York, and we took out a loan from this individual, and we uh, used my parents' home as collateral – for that wow. for that loan and we had to pay a 20% about a 20% interest rate which means best case scenario I owe 20% <laughs> if I pay the principal back I also have to pay 20% on top of that yeah uh so that's about a half a million dollars I have to pay on top of it so I take it take the money and I transfer it to a bank in Mongolia I arrive a year later and I go to the bank to take out the two and a half million dollars and I'm going to take it out in cash because that's the only way you can transact or it used to be the only way we could transact. I can't get it from one bank. I end up going to six different banks and each time they just load up bundles of cash into plastic <laughs> shopping bags. And I end up walking out of the bank carrying bags of money with me 
and I end up having about 32 of these plastic shopping bags. I load them in the back of the Land Cruiser, and I drove 20 hours out into the Gobi Desert where I purchased 60 tons of cashmere. As a reference point, that's about 20 full tractor trailers that I then trucked back to Lombachar to start processing. At the same time that I did that, I also spent about $150,000 on nonprofit work on a veterinary program, and I inoculated about half a million goats, which was for about a 1,000 families of herders. It was at the time, and I think it probably still is, the largest privately funded nonprofit program in the country's history. Wow. But that was my incentive. I said, you work with me. Let me buy from you. I will give you this nonprofit program to keep your animals healthy for five years. Wow. And so we use a local community to help execute that because that's catching approximately a million goats um, because you do four inoculations. Yeah. So it was a huge, huge program. We got the material back to Ulaanbaatar. We processed it and we shipped it to Italy where we started spinning a luxury yarn and then started manufacturing sweaters and selling those sweaters. That was two and a half years ago, and since then this business has grown like crazy, and I don't think we even really have told our story quite yet, um, but it's been really growing off of a couple unique value propositions, which is we sell a higher quality product than all of our competitors at a better price than all our competitors. We get to the market faster than our competitors because we own the material but not manufacturing. We leverage discounts on the back of that yarn material ownership and I think that there are also some really big macro influences on our growth one being that cashmere a four billion dollar market is growing 15 percent annually mm -hmm. and its market size will double by 2021 to be eight billion and the people that have been in this industry the longest can't compete where growth is taking place online and within the millennial generation and the emerging middle class in China. So yeah. we're positioned perfectly from just like an, a business standpoint to yeah. acquire that. At the end of the day, our story is hinged on something I think extremely unique, which is we have found a way to use in its truest sense sustainability to provoke a type of innovation that results in a better a better product and a better price, a better value proposition ultimately for a growing customer base. So it's been really, really fun. Um, but so that's kind of the story. Wow. Uh, <laughs> There's like so much there that I have been furiously writing notes about um, that I have so many questions on. Um, so, I mean, so for people, if, if you haven't caught by now, Nadam is a, and, and I want you also to explain what Nadam means, um, but Nadam is a, you're a high-end luxury, ethically sourced and ethically made cashmere company. And I, I mean, your products are beautiful. I have <laughs> gloriously stocked the website for all the just, I mean, just so many beautiful things and um you know but this is a this is a material and this is a product that i mean cashmere has been around forever and it's always just one of those things that you know just has that luxurious sense about it even when you hear the word cashmere you know like you think about for decades you know and maybe even hundreds of years you know people have always like longed for like a really nice cashmere scarf or a cashmere sweater um but you know it's you share some really interesting information about just kind of what life is like for these farmers and how this is, you know, and so cashmere comes, is it just from goats or is it goats and alpacas? It just comes from goats. goats However, okay. the alpaca thing is interesting. We think that we can replicate what we've done in Mongolia with the alpaca industry in Peru. Yeah. We've pretty, we're pretty far along the line of, establishing a supply chain there that's really to, that's uh, do do what we did in Mongolia and Peru but um, don't want to give too much away there. yeah no for sure um, but you know it, you know it's something that I don't think a lot of consumers really take the time to think about of, of when you buy that luxurious cashmere sweater or that cashmere scarf like all that went into it and I was actually having this conversation with a friend I've wondered over the years, what is it about cashmere that makes it so expensive? Because especially when you go into like, for example, you go to J. Crew and you can buy a cashmere sweater there for maybe 90, maybe $90. Or mm -hmm. you can go to, you know, Bergdorf and buy a, you know, 
high end black label type yeah. cashmere sweater for fifteen hundred dollars. And but at the same at the end of the day, you look at the the materials, it's the exact same sweater. So, you know, what what so, is it in your experience and what you've learned? What is it about cashmere that one just makes it so expensive to begin with but two what do you think has happened over the years in the industry that has caused such a discrepancy in the markup and then also just you know obviously when you're talking about the the middlemen and and you're talking about um you know the farmers not being paid a fair wage in addition to the factory workers not being paid a fair wage the mill not being paid a fair wage um i just i guess i'd love to know kind of what you've learned has been kind of caused that over the years. Yeah. So really, really interesting points you bring up. And to clarify, we make that Bergdorf Goodman sweater. We just sell it for closer to the J. Crew price. Right, right. That's the goal, right? That's the objective because yeah. the Bergdorf thing should really be the J. Crew price. You don't want the real th- the thing that J. Crew is actually selling you is the thing that um, is not is hardly – cashmere and there yeah. are as so what happened was you, i would say 10 years ago people started to sense there was an increased demand for the luxury material started to have as you've just specified a cachet of a, a kind of um started to mean something there was a connotation of luxury that it started to represent and right. so they saw the demand and they wanted to find a way to supply it and so that resulted in cutting corners to get a similar to kind of get that. Uh, I wouldn't call it a similar product, but I would call it the same named product. And the way they do that is developing really cheap yarns, Mm -hmm. using wastage of yarns, Mm -hmm. using um, inferior quality raw material and propping it up through manufacturing processes that fluff fluff it up and lighten it up. If you buy a sweater at that really low price, it'll fall apart inevitably because you have the lowest end of quality material in the product is actually not meant to stay together. Yeah. And then they overwashed it to make it so, so, so soft, but that destroys the product mm. because on its own, it wasn't actually soft enough. So what they got was an inferior quality that wasn't going to be soft. And then they they literally manufactured something that felt similar, but really was, was not. Right. So that's the discrepancy. It's really a lack of education and right. no one wanting to explain it. And so our role as a company, I think is very straightforward. We're the only people in the world that do business like this legitimately. We're the only big people in the world that do it transparently and know the real value of what it is we own. Yeah. When we yeah. buy cashmere, we do it down to a science. When we blend our materials in manufacturing, it's a science. It's percentages of long fibers and short fibers and gray fibers and white fibers and micron lengths. We know down to the detail exactly what we're putting in that material. Now, it's it's much easier for a manufacturer for a brand to just buy what's available, not invest the time in developing what we've developed. Mm-hmm. So there's no there's no education. There's no there's no transparency and what you got at J. Crew, I promise you will fall apart very quickly. Yeah. And and um, furthermore, in terms of the exact specifications of it, doesn't have a lot in common with what you were finding in Bergdorf Goodman. Yeah. And I think that distinction is incredibly important for people to understand. As we grow, our job is to push that conversation, lead the conversation, and make sure that we own the right to be doing what we're doing and um uh, clearing up kind of the mess in the area. Cashmere comes from goats regardless. Yeah. But it can be – I've seen it. It can be destroyed throughout the process of, of manufacturing. Um, you know, I grew up with the same feeling you felt that is like, oh, cashmere, so so beautiful. It's what my grandpa wore, my parents wore. And, yeah. And I afford that. I saw the window at Laurel Piana and thought, what, $1,000, $1,500 for a sweater is crazy. I wanted that product. Yeah. I wanted that product. I wanted my friends to have that product. That's what we sell. We sell that product. Very, very little actually different from that product and the one we sell. We don't want to sell the one that Uniqlo sells, the one that J. Crew sells, right? Uh, because there's no value. We can't we can't build a business that's hinged on a, a quality assertion um, if we do that. And we are dedicated to 
quality above all else. And listen, it's very interesting that that's ultimately a byproduct of that crazy trip I just explained. Yeah. Because it's just so – it's it's amazing to me kind of how stuff like that ends up happening. And it's it's funny in the hundreds of conversations I've had with business owners and, um, you know, especially in this kind of ethical and sustainable space, so many of them – I mean, there's a common thread where almost all of them didn't necessarily set out to do this. It was more like they went on a trip or they got connected to somebody. They started learning about a problem or a story. They saw a problem. And instead of just going back and saying, ah, you know, that's that's a shame. Somebody should really do something about that. They decided they're like, OK, well, I guess I'm that somebody. And then they decided to get into business. And I think it's um kind of like what um Yvonne Chouinard, the founder of Pat- Patagonia, says where he's like he's a reluctant businessman. Um, he's a reluctant entrepreneur because it's just kind of like, well, I guess that, you know, I'm going to I'm going to solve the problem um, rather than sitting back and and, you know, saying somebody else should do something about it. Yeah, and I, well, I think that that's ultimately what defines an entrepreneur, though, at the end right. of the day. Yeah. Like I, an entrepreneur wouldn't have seen the problem and decided to fix it. Okay, I know that you guys are loving this conversation with Matt, but let's take a quick break from talking with Matt and let me tell you about the amazing company that is helping to make this show possible. Our sponsor today is Globin. Globin is the only fair trade verified subscription box company that empowers artisans around the world through job creation and fair wages. Globin's best-selling artisan boxes are filled with beautiful handmade and ethically produced home goods, beauty finds, and wearable accessories. Each artisan box has gorgeous and unique pieces like hand-painted ceramics from Morocco, hand-blown glassware from Mexico, or handmade jewelry from India. My October artisan box was the Beauty Box, and it has a stunning hand-carved wooden compact mirror, you know, for when you need to check your lipstick, a gorgeous, bright, and colorful cosmetic bag from Ghana. I can't wait to use it on my upcoming trip to Disney. And a scrunchie from Kenya. You guys, a scrunchie. It's so cute and fun, and it makes me feel like it's 1996 again, and I'm a pretty big fan. And it also comes in this gorgeous woven leaf basket from Mexico, which is perfect for organizing beauty products in my bathroom. Also, in case you didn't know, we are just a few weeks away from the holiday season, and Globin offers corporate gifts. Think about how much more meaningful your holiday gifts to your employees, clients, or your coworkers would be with a Globin artisan box. Now, you can use the coupon code Molly for $10 off any Artisan Box premium subscription. Visit Globin.com slash box for more details. That's Globin, G-L-O-B-E-I-N dot com slash box with the coupon code Molly for $10 off. And remember, if you haven't heard my podcast interview with Liza Moiseva, the founder of Globin, go back and check out episode 25 to learn more about her and this amazing company. Now back to my conversation with Matt Scanlon of Notum. So where does the name come from? Uh, so it's the name of a festival in uh, Mongolia. And it's been going on for years. And the festival is a series of games held over a couple of days. Uh, everything from wrestling and archery and horseback riding. Uh, and it's used as a time to celebrate um, culture, the heritage of the country, the nomadic herder and the nomadic heritage. Yeah. And yeah. they want to, bring through these games, bring nomadic herders and people that live in the city together remind everybody that we're mongolian more or less and the reason we chose the name i think you made a lot of sense uh, regardless of whether or not we're doing cashmere or anything else is we want to make sure that whatever we do celebrates the people and the culture and the heritage the places ultimately of the things we we own right, right. and so if it was a alpaca sweater it still stands if we're celebrating the heritage of the people and and those places that they came from yeah um so that's that's our overall goal we do that a lot of different ways we do it through nonprofit work we do it by redeveloping supply chains but we use business to do good um and we don't use it as a marketing scheme and i think people nowadays have become like they see, I've seen comments, but they see kind of our position and they're immediately skeptical. They're immediately like, this is a marketing gimmick because so much of that is happening. Mm-hmm. And I oftentimes feel like I don't want to throw the language in people's face and show all this stuff and because it's artificial. 
That's not why I don't do it so that I can show people I did it. I do, I do it because it actually helps people and it builds a better business. Oh, absolutely. And that's one of the reasons I'm so passionate about this kind of stuff too, is because at the end of the day, you know, when you support a company like Nadam or you support, you know, a small business that's working in a developing nation or a, uh, a company that is working to manufacture goods in the United States or, you know, they're doing everything they can to, you know, be transparent about all levels of their supply chain and knowing from start to finish how the people are being paid and how the people are being treated. Like it really does make a difference. And kind of going back to what you were saying at the beginning with, um, you know, when you when you invest in a in a an economy like that, when you invest in a, in the economy of a de- developing nation, you give one person a dollar and then they give another person a dollar and so on and so forth. Like the trickle down effects of that are so. I mean, just it, it's something that it's I think is hard for us in the U.S. to comprehend because, you know, we go to the store and we buy our groceries and whatever. We don't really think about it. But the effect of one dollar invested in a local economy can mean, you know, a kid can go to school. It can mean a, a father is able to provide for his family. It can mean a mother, a single mom is able to provide for her kids. Like, it means food on the table. I mean, it's life changing, life altering things and and you were like you were saying about how these these farmers like this is their living this is their culture this is how they make a life for themselves and their families and when they're being I mean essentially shafted by these brokers who are you know undercutting them and not paying them a fair wage I mean that has so many negative effects but you know at the end of the day like we just as consumers most consumers just don't think about that stuff but I've I've had this conversation a lot with people about how I really feel like over the next few years this is we're going to see a big shift in this and I think we're going to see in the goods fashion and goods industries we're going to see a shift like we saw with food in the last 10 years um because I you know over the last 10 years we've seen people really care about their food being organic and supporting local farmers like farm to table type stuff and I keep saying, like, I really think the next five to 10 years, we're going to see that in goods and fashion, people wanting to know where their stuff comes from. And, and in so much of what you guys did, and I think I actually read this in an article is you guys have basically, basically created a farm to table approach for luxury fashion. Yeah, I mean, that's the inevitability of what we've done. I think, uh, additionally, we've, we've made sure that we've also addressed maybe some of the problems that exist in luxury fashion as a whole. Right. Yeah, that, absolutely. That, you know, we think there's a much bigger opportunity for us that it's not a small farm to table esque business. It's really um, a very scalable, huge business opportunity. And if we can present that and it's successful, we can not only help move forward the conversation across all industries, but we can prove that it's doable. And I remember when I was first getting started and there were a lot of entrepreneurs and founders that I really looked up to and I felt like there weren't a lot that I looked up to that shared my same value system Mm -hmm. Uh, Mm -hmm. and it was disheartening and maybe it meant that it wasn't possible and so the more successful we are the more possible we show it is I what I would love is if people copied everything we did right there's nothing proprietary about it it's not the only innovation is that we started listening to people and having conversations and building equitable agreements and relationships. That's it. You know, it's not something that should have been happening that yields ultimately much, much better business results. Right. So. Absolutely. I love what you said about you just you just listened. You just listened. And that is so important. I think there's and and I think you even said this earlier too of just you're now you're really disrupting the cashmere industry and it just started from listening and that's kind of my you know my like life goal and mission is I, I my goal is to educate consumers to start asking questions and just go to companies and go to brands and ask them who made their who made who makes your clothes who makes your stuff where is it made are they being treated fairly? Are they being paid a fair wage? Do they have, you know, access to education or, you know, medical care or whatever? Because I I really feel like the more consumers that start asking those questions, that's going to disrupt the big brands that 
aren't doing it right, so to speak, and they're going to start listening and, and kind of like what you guys have done from the business side by g- setting that standard, you're influencing other companies to step up to the plate and and do better. And that's it's that's just it's hope. so important. That's the hope. And I think, you know, the 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 other piece of it is I would always get upset when I felt like if someone thought something was sustainable, that that meant it cost more money. And that's crazy. If it's really sustainable, it should be, it should cost less. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I want people to see that, that if you do something, it's sustainable doesn't mean much really. Right. I mean, like the, the term is loosely used in a lot of different marketing language. No one knows what the real definition is. And so for us, it's just like, sustainable business like we want to make a good business which means you get a better product at a better price um that should be the end goal right like or or else you you fall short because if you can't tackle those two things then you can't get people to buy it and keep it want to keep coming back you can't have a business that grows over and over and over the bigger we get the more good we do Mm -hmm. and so the two really need to go hand in hand you know pricing things through the roof doesn't make sense to me either. It's fairness across the board. It's fair to the people we work with and it's fair to the people we sell to. That should be the ultimate objective. Yes, absolutely. Um, So I have two more questions that I'm really curious uh, to hear your answer to. So, you know, for people that maybe don't know kind of how cashmere is, you know, the fur from the goats is actually harvested, you know, for the people who are listening, who are maybe like, maybe they're traditional, maybe they're vegan, maybe they are really curious about animal rights. Like, what is Mm -hmm. it like for, obviously, we know the importance of taking care of the people. What's it like for the goats? I mean, obviously, getting rid of goat fur is a pretty common practice, but you guys do something a little bit different because it's an old school um, hand combing method rather than shearing them. So I'd be kind of curious for you to kind of educate us on that part of it. So so shearing is typically a very painful process for the animal. It'd be like if I like aggressively cut the hair off your head. Mm-hmm. It would hurt, right? And right. you um, oftentimes like rip out skin. It's a, an mm-hmm. awful, brutal process, but it's very common. Um, more in China than it is Mongolia. Uh, and that's because herders don't have electricity, so they don't have electric electric shearers. Yeah. So they hand comb. They've hand combed for hundreds of years, so nothing's changed. Hand combing is like if I came over and combed your hair for you right. rather than cut it all off. You'd be like, oh, thanks for not you know torturing me. <laughs> yeah. um, hand combing is the most the most humane way to treat the animal. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's also the best way to get the best fibers. You just comb out. The softest, best fiber, it's like so, it's like pre-sorting it. If you shear it all off, you also have to then sort out the bad stuff and the good stuff. But if you hand comb it, you're, you pull out the best fibers all at one time. So it's best from a quality standpoint and best from a humane perspective. It's very important to us, but honestly, it's not something that I preordained. It's a consequence of working with nomadic, nomadic herders. Yeah. Absolutely. No, that's really interesting. And honestly, I had no idea kind of how that works. And, you know, because I not it's an area that I'm just not super educated on, to be honest. I I didn't know that people weren't educated on it, which is like, in hindsight, stupid, uh, because like, why would anyone know about that? <laughs> but I started looking at comments in our ads on Facebook and stuff like that. And people were like, this is not humane. This is cruelty. And I'd be like, what? <laughs> like, what are you talking about? There's nothing cruel about anything that we do. And it's not like I don't know. I have combed the animals myself. I've sat there and done it. Like, yeah. it's a very funny thing. And I guess, you know, the good news is people think everything's bullshit until you <laughs> prove that it isn't. And that's great. That's great for me because we do what we say. So, right. I love that people want to call bullshit on us. I got nothing to hide, you know? Um, and so it'll it'll help me get rid of people that are probably lying. Yeah. No, I didn't think that's a really – but I think, it, like you said, it's a good it's a good opportunity to educate people as well. And then there's – I mean, there's always going to be internet trolls. But <laughs> in general, like, you know, when, when it gives you an opportunity to say, hey, actually, this is – you know, 
this is good for people. This is good for the animals. Um, you know, but I, I could go on about that in general. But um, I love going about Internet trolls. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh that's, a, that's another topic for another day. <laughs> <laughs> um, so my last like main question uh, before we wrap up is because I, I I like to ask the questions that I feel like my listeners are going to be sitting at home listening to the show and wanting to know the answer to as well. Um, yeah. I have to know what was it like carrying around two million dollars in cash <laughs> around Mongolia? Uh-huh. Were you terrified that somebody was going to rob you of two million dollars in cash? Like, how, I mean, just the the idea of physically carrying $2 million in cash, one, blows my mind. But two, I'm like, you're in Mongolia with $2 million in cash. Like, how do, do you just, you're just like casually walking around <laughs> with $2 million kind of, in cash? Kind, kind of. I mean, um, it's 65 pounds of money. So it's That's a insane. lot of tape. Um, you kind of just compartmentalize it. I didn't really think about it. I don't, you know, I didn't go have any protection. We didn't have a gun anywhere in sight, you know, like it didn't even occur to us. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know why. I mean, I think I was just so set on what I needed to do that I wasn't really concerned with that kind of stuff. I was like, okay, now I got to get the money. Now I got to drive here. Now I got to buy it. Now I got to go do this. There was so much unknown kind of on the other side of things. Yeah. Now I got to get it. I got to figure out how to make yarn. I got to figure out how to make a sweater. I got to figure out how to sell it and market it and build a company that it was like the furthest thing from my mind was like, what if someone kills me and takes this? Like I wasn't, (laughs) it's, 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 I know it's strange, but it didn't cross my mind for a second. Well, maybe that's just like the rule of thumb in life is like when you, when you suddenly have $2 million in cash and you're carrying it around, just act like it's no big deal. <laughs> Don't call attention to it. Honestly, if I'd gone out, though, with, like, guns and arms, whatever, I would have drawn more attention. You know, yeah. people are like, huh, what's that about? Let me go and investigate that, see if I want to rob that guy. You know, like, <laughs> I think just playing it cool sometimes works. Yeah, just play it cool. Yeah. Play it cool. Uh, yeah. Well, Matt, well, here as we wrap up, um, I mean, I just think your story is so awesome. I'm really excited to just kind of see, you know, watch you guys continue to grow. And um, like you said, just kind of disrupt this, you know, luxury fashion industry. And, um, you know, it's a it's a product that has been around for years and will continue to be around. And I think the more that we can have people out there like you guys doing it right, the better. Um, so I, like I said, I can't wait to see you guys continue to grow. Um, obviously, for those that are listening, you can visit their website at nadam.co.co, and that's N-A-A-D-A-M dot C-O. Um, what is on the horizon for you guys here in the fall and into winter and into 2018? And what do we have to look forward to from you guys? So, so much. So we open our first store in Soho in September. Amazing. Um, We are launching home goods, so blankets and pillow shams and other items. We have a blanket that's a kilo of cashmere for $300. It's the coolest thing we've ever done. Um, We're also opening up a shop and shop in Bloomingdale's on 59th Street, so you can come visit us there as well. We'll be opening a shop and shop at Hudson Bay in um canada at the same time and then throughout the fall we're launching our first leisure wear program so like sweatpants and shirts and pullover hoodies all made out of our liquid cashmere which is like like the name says it all it's pretty unbelievable yeah like super Uh, soft and we'll be launching new items every 15 days until the end of the year so sign up signing up for our email list is kind of the best or the best way to kind of get in on the it normally sells out really quickly so the best way to get in on on that stuff um we're signing up for the wait list but that's kind of how we've built the business so far uh but a ton a ton's happening that's amazing and what do you are you guys on social media what's the best uh way to get you connect with you guys there yeah just not him cashmere is our uh instagram awesome instagram handle. yep awesome well matt thank you so much for your time today for coming on the show and uh, i just can't wait to, to like i said i can't wait to watch you guys um, over the next couple months and years to come. Awesome. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the time and uh, feedback and everything else. I honestly think that my mouth was dropped open 
the entire time I was talking with Matt. His stories are incredible and it kind of sounds like a movie. I don't even think you could make up a movie that is as crazy and as interesting and fascinating as what Matt and his business partner experienced in the Gobi Desert and just that time that they spent in Mongolia. But most of all, I love that after such an adventure, Matt decided to actually do something about really disrupting the cashmere industry. And I love, love, love what Nadam is doing. If you check out the show notes for today's episode, I've also got a video that they just produced about the Nadam story. And trust me, you are going to want to go watch it because it is awesome. I'm so grateful to Matt for coming on the show this week, and I hope you guys love this episode. And thank you so much for listening. If you are a first-time listener of the show, welcome. Be sure to visit the archives for past shows featuring other amazing entrepreneurs who are literally changing the world with their businesses. And if you're a regular listener of the show, thank you so much for your support week in and week out. Be sure to head on over to iTunes, Google Play, Radio Public, or wherever you listen to podcasts, and make sure you are subscribed to the show. Clicking that subscribe button really makes sure that you never miss an episode of the podcast. Podcast. And while you are there, would you mind taking a moment and leaving a review of the show? Here is a review from Caitlin. It says, we are big podcast people, so we are really picky about what we commit to listen to. I love Molly and I love her heart behind all of this. Anyone with a business or an interest in starting a business needs to tune in. Thank you so much for that review, Caitlin. And if you would mind leaving a review, I would love, love, love it. It means the world to me and lets me know how this show is personally impacting you. If you decide to share this show with a friend on social media, you can use the hashtag business with purpose podcast and tag me at still being Molly so that I can also give you some love. It just means the world to me when you share this show. Thank you again to Globin for sponsoring today's episode. Don't forget to go to globin.com slash box and use the coupon code Molly for $10 off your artisan premium subscription. This show is edited by my amazing husband and executive producer, John Stillman, and the music is by Mark Killian of Third Wheel Media. Thank you so much for listening and go do something good with purpose on purpose.